Hello everyone and welcome. I'm glad for your company. I don't know about you, but in winter my picture-taking mood sinks to an all-time low. It's cold out, there's often little usable light, and yes, I fell on the ice this year and sprained my ankle, knee and hip. I also got the flu. I'm back out there now, only a little worse for wear, and I've worked out ways to take good pictures when the conditions say that's impossible. On top of everything else, we haven't had any snow this year. Being stuck inside with bad winter weather and a bad winter mood or injury is common, but at least you can usually count on a sunny day after a snowstorm to provide scenes worth snapping in winter. Last year I got this photo. I had to drive five miles in slush and ice, navigate another hundred yards on a rutted dirt road to a backcountry parking lot and then walk another mile to reach the bridge. At least it was worth it. What great results you can get if you put in the effort and risk life and limb and use more artistic camera settings for your wintertime scenes and bird shots. For my winter photography, I tried to bring out the artsy side of the pictures by using the vivid settings on my camera and upping the color saturation and the sharpness while using the dynamic range setting of five to even out the contrast and colors. So let's see what happens when we go out hunting for pictures in this dim landscape with these settings. If you've watched my other videos, you know I love photographing birds. Only a fool would dislike birds, or another bird that's being attacked by a bigger bird or a fox. I was photographing this sparrow when something like that happened. Most photographers might walk right past this little brown creature, thinking it's not that interesting. But one thing I've done in this photo is bring out the color in life by using the vivid setting in the creative style. With these settings, I managed to get this stunning photo of a wintertime sparrow that most would pass up. While I was photographing this little guy and making him shine, I sensed the whooshing off my left shoulder about 10 feet away and turned just in time to see a cooper's hawk glide by me. I guess he was unwilling to grab my little friend, the sparrow, while I was there, but he did make a half-hearted effort in attacking the thick undergrowth a little ways up the path where I couldn't reach him. He missed catching anything. Then he settled in a sycamore tree about 50 feet away. I thought he would flee, but he just sat there, hungry, I guess, as I approached. I got about as close as I thought I could before somehow taking this photo of a hawk in the tangle of branches. Somehow the Sony focused on him through the branches. I was very surprised I even got this photo in the low light and while he hid in the branches. I've always been persistent though. So I walked close, hoping for a full frame shot and still he did not move. He must have been very hungry, cold and tired just to sit there as I approached. I've never known a Cooper's Hawk to stay in place when a photographer got so close in the wild. Finally, he decided he had had about enough for the persistent photographer. He worked his way out of the tangles and flew back the way he had come. But our story still didn't end there. He alighted on a thin branch behind me, one I didn't think could hold his weight. He must really have been starving. He stayed there long enough for me to get the photo of him I wanted. And then he was off into the field next to the path where he dove into the tall weeds. I assumed to find a meal among the mice, as the fox had. 
I used the same vivid settings on him that I used on the Sparrow, again with some astonishing results. Winter wasn't was so bad, I thought, if a starving photographer could get this sort of shot from a chronically famished hawk. I played my hunger games with him from a different point of view. The overcast light for these two photos was great to bring out the colors of the birds. The low light worked to my advantage, as overcast light often does. Sometimes even the most banal scenes can turn out to be enchanting and evocative if the light is good and fits for the photograph. The hawks weren't done with me that day though. As I was driving out of the park, I saw a red tailed hawk sitting on a birdhouse next to the access road. He wasn't at all concerned as I stopped the car, rolled down the window and trained my HX 400V camera on him. Red tails are considerably bigger than Cooper's hawks, so he must have been suffering the same deprivations of winter, but worse. The Coopers had merely flown near me twice and then sat on branches with me close, with a sense to move on then. But the red tail didn't want to move on at all. He sat there for quite a while while I figured out more and more ways to photograph him. The light was not good, so the camera had some difficulties at times focusing tack sharp, but I used the same vivid settings I had on the Cooper's Hawk. I had just had more time to take all sorts of shots as he posed in several different ways. Then sometimes there's bright light and willing subjects and you're truly fortunate. With bright empty scenery now framing our friends, the birds, I thought I might still use the vivid settings and my persistence to capture some fine close-ups with the Sony. I think aside from the bright light, there was something else working for me with these photos. This red tail was high in a tree, but he stayed put for more time than I had to photograph him. Since he was so high, I initially used the clear image zoom to double the 1200 millimeter length of the Carl Zeiss lens on the HX400V. I stood on a slight rise. I tried several compositions since he gave me so much time. I went back to the normal 1200 millimeter zoom at times using the flexible spot setting. I used the large flexible spot setting and held the camera as tightly as I could, pressed up to my face for extra stability. The optical stabilization of the lens helped me out immensely, as it always does. Hunger always seems to be an issue with bird photography in winter. If you want to find birds, look where there might be food for them. Even in the middle of February, there's food to be found in nature, whether it's other birds and squirrels in the case of these hawks, or seeds and fruit in the case of vegetarian birds. When birds are desperately in search of food, they have more of a tolerance for photographers. It helps to have an extremely long lens, as the HX400V does, but even that size lens is of no use if the bird is not desperate to eat. Birds will flee if they see you from hundreds of feet away under normal circumstances. If you can get close enough to use the 400 millimeter of the Sony, you'll still have to be able to frame the bird and hold that immense lens steady. And again, you need good light. I was surprised to see this flicker in the tree just above me tolerate my presence. And then I saw the dried up fruit through the lens and I realized he was hungry. He wasn't going to pass up a meal just because someone pointed a camera at him. Flickers normally don't tolerate a human anywhere near. The light was not good, but
but I still managed to get a few decent shots of this beautiful bird. It was lucky there was plenty of light when I ran across a group of bluebirds in a tree 50 feet off the trail. That's quite a distance, but the Sony's long lens made it possible, but still difficult, to photograph these birds as they foraged on dry berries. Photographing through the 2400 millimeter lens of the DSCH x 400 v is like photographing through a broomstick with a pinhole cut through the center of it. If not for their hunger and willingness to spend time with them, these photos would not have been possible. For this next series of shots, it was also very cold and it froze over the lake at Washington Crossing State Park in Pennsylvania, making it impossible for this gorgeous great blue heron to fish. He decided instead to roost in a tree on one leg to relax and suffer through his hunger like a trooper. He didn't much mind me. In fact, he seemed to scorn my presence. Herons shouldn't be approached. That long nasty bill will take out your eye in a flash. I've seen them eat rabbits and snakes. Not all birds are as confident as the great blue heron or as unwilling to be disturbed while they wade out a frozen lake. Most will keep a wary eye on you. This red-winged black bird made an early appearance in Pennsylvania next to the great blue heron. He shouldn't have migrated here in mid-February and he looked cold and frazzled being used to a more tropical venue at this time of year. I felt sorry for him that his climate sense had abandoned him and he was living through a dangerous miscalculation, having denied the climate change around him. In the end, all photographers have to decide if they want to be artists or journalists and how they will use technology. Being either an artist or a journalist is fine and up to you. But in the end, you must know your subjects and what they're experiencing. And you must know your light both outside the camera and how it appears inside the camera. Thanks for watching. Now bundle up and go outside. <music>